We do have an acolyte. <coughs> Birthday sound check, yeah? This is your Sunday morning birthday sound check. Birthday greetings go out today to Janice Becker, Robert Carpenter, Max Kleben, Andrew Lockhard, Becky Prater, Elizabeth Scott, Elisa Sampon, Kevin Steen, and Vanessa Turner. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Happy birthday to you. Okay. Y'all tell me when you're ready. Welcome to worship with us at Harrisburg United Methodist Church. It is our joy and our privilege to welcome you into worship both in the building and online. We're glad that you are here for worship this morning. Um, I'm going to invite you um, wherever you are to stand um, as we prepare to do our greeting and sing our opening hymn. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Tony Ruth Smith. I am the pastor here along with my husband Wes and it's our privilege to welcome you on this Christ the King Sunday. It is getting ready to be New Year in the Christian church, and so today we celebrate the reign of Christ. If you would join me in the call to worship. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Blessing and honor and glory and might be unto the Lamb. Worthy is Christ, who has ransomed us by his blood, from every tribe and tongue and nation, and made his people a kingdom and priest to our God. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's sing together, uh, Rejoice the Lord as King.
may be seated. It is a beautiful, glorious day outside, and we are delighted to be in worship and particularly thankful um, for all of you. I hope that there were lots of you that were able to be here on Friday when we um, raised the cross on our new construction, and lots of you um, were able to join us online or watch that video later. If you haven't, I'm going to encourage you to go to Facebook on our church web page, our church uh, Facebook page, and you could see the video of when we, we raised the cross. I had several people tell me that it was more emotional and meaningful than they thought it would be. Um, it's such a simple thing. It was such a small action, but such a reminder of who we are and what our witness is and what our purpose is, why we have been doing all this construction. You know, one of the things that, um, that we were trying to address in our new build was to sort of pull the building out of the hole, you know, to get us a little bit closer to 49 and to give us a better presence. Um, the running joke in, in the church office is that we get mistaken for the DMV probably three times a week, and that is not a joke. Um, I really, I promise I wish I were laughing about that, and I'm just not. Um, the, the project uh, supervisor said to me about three weeks into the project, he said, do you get people asking if you're the DMV a lot? Because people stop me all the time. And I was like, well, um, well, I will tell you, if you drive up and down 49, no one's going to think we're the DMV anymore. Um, it screams, this is a church, and, um, and it bears better into the world the witness of Christ. The song that was singing, that we were playing, that y'all couldn't hear online, but we were playing it out here, was Lift High the Cross. Jesus says um, in the scripture, if I am but lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And um, sometimes we forget and we think we are the ones that are saving people. We don't save anybody. It's just our job to lift up the name of Jesus in the things we say, in the things we do, in the way that we live and witness and love all people. And Jesus does the rest of the work. So in thanksgiving and gratitude to him for his goodness, let's pray together for the future of our witness as a church body. King of kings and Lord of lords, what an honor and a privilege to be your children. What an honor and a delight to call you Savior and friend and Father and Lord. We, Lord, look across our own lives and we know why we worship you. We know the moments that you have spoken into our spirits and inspired us through your word and taught us the way to live. In your scripture, Lord, you say that you are the way and you are the truth and you are the life. And truly, God, you are all those things for us. You show us the way to live, to walk away from the things of our past and to find new light and new hope in you and in your way. When we are racked by grief or filled with anger, your way teaches us a better way, a way of peace, a way of hope, a way of love and goodness. Truly you are the truth. And when we are tempted to believe a lie that says we are anything less than beloved children of God, you speak to us a different word and you remind us who we are. You remind us the truth that you are a righteous judge, but that you are also a merciful father. And in ways that we don't understand, you hold those two things together and teach us a better way. And Lord, you are life. You are the breath that we breathe. You are hope in every moment. You are the one that shows us how to live a life that truly is worthy of our calling as children of God. The way that you call us to live is full of kindness and compassion, understanding and wisdom. It is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that your spirit is working within us. How grateful, God, we are. We pray, Lord, for the witness of your church, not just this church, but all those who gather in your name of every denomination and every tongue and every race and every tribe around the world. And we pray that we may be faithful to lift up your way and your truth and your life and how you have changed ours. And we ask, God, that we would have the courage to trust that you will do everything else. 
that you will speak into the darkness as you spoke into ours, that you will lift up others as you lifted us, that you will show the way to others as you have shown it to us. And Lord, when we stumble and when we fail, because we do, pick us up again and remind us who we follow, that we may be servants of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We pray, God, that you would help us to bear that witness to those who are sick of body, mind, or spirit. We pray that you would help us to share that witness when we ourselves feel like we are in the darkness. We pray, God, that you would help us to share that witness in our communities, in our states, in our country, and in the world. That we would model a different way of being. Remind us, God, of how to be kingdom citizens and help us to be faithful to the task by your grace and by your sustaining power. We ask all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray together. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's um, first reading will come to us from Matthew. So before we pray the prayer of illumination um, and hear the scripture, I'm going to invite you to stand in honor of the reading of the gospel this morning. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, Lord, open our our hearts hearts and minds minds by the inspiration inspiration of the the Holy Spirit, Spirit, that that as the scriptures are read read and your your word proclaimed, we We may may hear hear with joy what you you say to us today. today. Amen. Amen. The reading comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was a visitor. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will say to them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least who are members of my family, you did it to me. And he will say to those on his left hand, You that are accursed, apart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of these, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and living of his holy word. Amen. Let's join in singing majesty. second reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Hear now the word of the Lord. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus 
and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God for all people. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are a couple places in Paul's letters where he talks about Jesus in a big picture kind of way. Uh, we usually say in those places, such as we just read about in Ephesians and uh, also in Colossians, that Paul is teaching about the cosmic Christ. And to our ears, uh, these passages can sound really weird. After all, uh, we have a very different understanding of the universe and our place in it than people who lived 2,000 years ago in Palestine. Uh, we have certainly a lot more knowledge, uh, technological advances than folks who lived 2,000 years ago, so we have a different understanding of the universe. So when Paul talks about the heavenly places, about Jesus being above all rule and authority and power and dominion, about God putting all things under Jesus' feet, it can feel sometimes, I think, a little disorienting for us a little confusing. We might have a hard time wrapping our heads around what Paul means. And there's also a translation issue here. And it makes passages, uh, like the end of Ephesians chapter 1, it can make them feel really abstract and mystical. Now the original text of Ephesians was written in Greek. And the letter of Ephesians was eventually included into what we call the New Testament. That kind of uh, 27 books was kind of solidified in the 4th century. And then later on in the 4th century, both the Old and New Testaments were translated from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. This translation was called the Vulgate. Vulgate just means the language or book of the people. Vulgate related to the word folk and vulgar, so it means of the people. The Latin at that point was a language of the street, the language of common people. Nearly a thousand years later, the first English translation appeared, the Wycliffe Bible, and 230 years later, King James Version appeared. At that point, the floodgates were open, and biblical translators haven't looked back. The Bible's translated into every language. There are translations and paraphrases and all number. It's just Pretty much uh, every language that exists, the Bible has been translated into that language. Now, the English translations that Methodists most often use in the United States, the New Revised Standard Version or the New International Version, those versions were taken straight from Hebrew and Greek, but we've nevertheless inherited some of the language of the English-speaking world from the early 17th century when the King James was translated. And we're a long way from England in the 16th and 17th century. 
For example, when we talk about power in our world, when we talk about leaders, we don't usually talk about kings or kingdoms or dominions. We don't use that language to talk about our leaders in America. When we talk about um, powers and dominions, we use words like government or judges or leaders or politicians. We don't often, as Paul t calls them, talk about powers and principalities in everyday language. What we do talk about is ideas and movements and values and cultures. I say all of that to say this. When you say that Jesus is Lord, that means that following Jesus is the defining fact of your life. Claiming Jesus as your Lord means that you're planting your feet firmly in the kingdom of God while still living in the kingdoms of the world. There we go again. That word kingdom isn't a word we typically use talking in our day-to-day -day living. And so I was thinking about, okay, what might be a better word how, to think about kingdom? And I got an idea from a commentary I was looking at this week that a better word to get at what Paul is, is teaching us about in Ephesians 1, it's culture. You know, I don't know what it's like to live in a kingdom. I've never lived in a kingdom. When I think of kingdom, at least me, I think of knights and squires and medieval castles. Uh, but I have lived in a culture, a number of them. And this gets fun for me. Those of you that know me know this is kind of right up my alley because I get to talk about the meaning of a word and you get to do a deep dive in like a word study kind of stuff. This is fun for me. I don't know what it's like for you, but you didn't write this sermon. I did, so there you go. <laughs> Culture is one of those words that's really tricky to define. And I'm, right now I'm going to break a rule of preaching. And they tell you when you preach to never give a dictionary definition. That's kind of a gimmick. And I know when I'm listening to people preach and they say, the dictionary definition of blah, blah, I kind of roll my eyes. I'm going to do that. So if you want to roll your eyes, go for it. Um, and the, when you look up culture in the dictionary, there are about you know, 10 different entries, a bunch of different ways to define it. But one that uh, I think uh, makes most sense for what we're talking about is a culture is a set of shared attitudes, values, goals and practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. Shared attitudes, values, goals, practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. <clears throat> In other words, when we say culture, what we mean is way of life. A way of life, a way of doing things, a way of thinking, a way of behaving, a, a way of uh, speaking. We are shaped by cultures. And there are a lot of different cultures to choose from in our world right now. Now, it hasn't always been this way. In fact, this is a pretty recent development in our world. And I think that's one reason we feel so disconnected from other people. That we, we're, we're losing kind of a common culture. And we can kind of choose which culture we want to belong to. And uh, that can lead to some disconnection. You know, when I was a kid, I was right, I grew up right at the tail end of this. Um, you know, growing up as a kid in the 80s, and then with the internet coming in the, the mid to late 90s, I kind of, my Antonio Roos generation was kind of the last gasp of this. But because I, most of you here um, who are our age and older, you remember when you got your news from three television channels, right? And everybody pretty much read the same magazines. Uh, and this was not just news sources. It was, uh, if, you, if you were alive in America in the 1980s, you couldn't escape, for example, the music of Michael Jackson. It didn't matter if you liked him or not. And same in the 90s. If you grew up in the 90s, uh, you couldn't escape the music of Garth Brooks. It was just everywhere. That's called, the, we were kind of living in what you call the monoculture. We had the same cultural experience, the same point of reference, the same uh, 
television channels and radio stations and all this other stuff. And with the advent of the internet and cable TV to some extent, that's gone. The monoculture is gone. So we're all kind of having these different experiences. We can choose what culture we want to be a part of. And that's pretty recent. That's new. We have this grab bag of cultures, and these cultures make claims on us. These cultures kind of require things. They make claim on our time, our attention, our resources, and our energy, even our identity. We are defined, in a lot of ways we define ourselves, by what cultures we're a part of. Um, when you say, you know, who are you? You know, tell me about yourself. Well, typically we start with the basic facts, you know, if, you know, if we're married, we're, we talk about, well, I'm married to this person, I have this many kids, here's what I do for a living, here's what I used to do, or I'm retired. And then we quickly go to, I enjoy this, 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 and this. And that's where we get to the cultures. And some of them are pretty harmless, they're pretty innocuous. Um, you know, like, you know, I don't know, bird watching is not, you know, that's not a bad culture. I mean, personally, Star Wars. That's a it's a culture. These are, these are subcultures. Uh, knitting. And if you don't think they're cultures, talk to somebody who knits all the time. Ask them about knitting, and within like 30 seconds, they're going to be using a bunch of words that you don't know about the practice of knitting. That's an indication of a culture. Uh, college sports. And uh, you can get more specific. The SEC definitely has a defined specific culture. Marching band is a culture. A lot of y'all knew that, right? Classic cars. I mean, you can list, we can go all day listing these things. Some of these move from being a culture that you, like a hobby that you just participate in, to becoming demanding, all-encompassing. What was a hobby becomes an obsession. It begins to claim your time and your attention. Some of them... Now, not the ones I listed necessarily, but some of them lead to some dark, even deadly places. Uh, there is in our country right now a militia culture that starts, uh, kind of can start with you know, reenactments or with hunting or gun enthusiasts, but it can lead for some to a deeper place of joining a militia, and it can go somewhere really dark which is a doorway into white supremacist culture in our country. And if you don't think that's dangerous, if you think there are just a bunch of guys running around the woods, uh, there was recently, uh, recently eight gentlemen in Michigan arrested for plotting to kidnap the governor of Michigan. And their, their backup plan, their plan B, was to find 200 like-minded militia members to overthrow the capital in Michigan. That's a culture that has moved to a very dark deadly place. All of these cultures, from the innocuous and harmless all the way to um, cultures that are evil and dangerous, all of these cultures in ways we might not even realize are competing for our attention. They're competing for us. They, they, they're making a, a, a claim on us, or trying to, and the claim of Christian discipleship is that there is one culture that is more central, more authoritative, more defining than any other culture. That is the culture of God. What we might call the kingdom of God. God's culture. So what does it mean to live in God's culture? Well, Jesus kind of spells it out for us. What does it mean to live in that culture of God. God's culture is like a sower throwing out seed. Some on the road, some on shallow soil, among thorns, some in good soil. The seed that lands in good soil grows and it multiplies. God's culture is like a mustard seed that's tiny but grows into a bush that provides shade. God's culture is where the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to find the one lost sheep. That's God's culture. God's culture is, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked 
You gave me clothing. I was sick. You took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. That's God's culture. God's culture is defined by the sacrificial, risk-taking, outcast-embracing love of Jesus. God's culture is where Jesus has the authority, where Jesus is Lord. And what that means, that's where Jesus defines who we are, what we do, what we say, how we live. The lordship of Jesus and the culture of God means that all those other cultures, whether it's politics, social media stuff, entertainment, sports, all of these come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. They are all under the rule and reign of Christ. This means that we have to make some decisions about what defines who we are. What do we build our lives on? What or who has power over us? This is more difficult than we might want to admit. And it's difficult in ways that might surprise us. Being defined by God's culture, being under the lordship of Jesus Christ, that means that we will feel out of step with other cultures. If we're defined by the set of shared values, attitudes, goals, and practices that characterize God's culture, if our way of life is increasingly centered on faithfulness to Jesus, then we will not be defined by the culture of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the Libertarian Party or any political party. It means we will not be defined by our allegiance to a certain politician or political movement. Our politics must come under the rule and reign and judgment of the Lord Jesus. And that may very well mean that our commitments will have to change. So that it's our commitment to Jesus that defines us and not our commitment to a political party or a movement. Remember, Jesus is above all rule and authority and power and dominion. To be in God's culture under the lordship of Jesus Christ means that how we treat people is not based on anything other than God's love revealed in Jesus. Obviously, as I mentioned, that, that applies to our politics. But it also, you know, it also applies to ACC basketball. And there I find myself under the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as a... Uh, as a Tar Heel fan, I'm in the minority among Methodist pastors. We are. Because we often said, you know, if you had, you know, Tony Ruth has told me, she's a, a Carolina graduate. I'm a happy App State graduate. Go Mountaineers. Uh, but grew up as a Tar Heel fan. And Tony Ruth told me, straight out, if you were a Duke fan, I wouldn't have been able to marry you. <laughs> and I said, I understand. The same goes for her, too. Um, but really, I posted a couple years ago, you know, something we joke about. Um, and when I was younger, a teenager, I, I, I talked junk a lot about Carolina basketball. That was back in when Duke won two in a row, and then Carolina won a national championship, the Christian Leitner years and all that stuff. I talked trash to a lot, especially... There were a lot of girls who loved Duke because Christian Leitner was cute. And, it, and for some reason, I let it get on my nerves, whatever. But I talked trash. But then I realized something. I don't like being on the receiving end. You know, I could dish it out, but I couldn't take it. And uh, Carolina has had some really terrible basketball teams um, in the last 20 years or so. And so I just kind of stopped talking junk. I don't talk junk on social media, whatever. But I posted a, uh, a Facebook uh, status update a couple of seasons ago I've noticed things were getting pretty heated among some of my friends and they were talking about Carolina fans in some really derogatory ways they were talking about Carolina graduates in some really derogatory ways and the Carolina fans were returning that back in kind it was two way street there and I, I posted that you know your being a fan of a certain team uh, 
does not excuse you from discipleship. You can't kind of section off a part of your life and say my discipleship doesn't apply to being a fan of Duke or Carolina basketball. It's the way we treat one another still matters. Uh, I didn't get a lot of likes on that <laughs> status update. It applies to everything. If, if how we treat people is based on God's love revealed in Jesus. We could find any number of reasons based on cultures to separate ourselves, to look down on people, to make fun of people, to reject people. The kind of entertainment you like, fashion, what you wear. I mean, the kind of car you drive. The list could go on forever. We, it seems like people are eager to find reasons to judge one another. And Jesus calls us out of that. God calls us to a higher standard when we're in the culture of God, when we're under the lordship of Jesus. God calls us to the standard of Jesus Christ. God calls us to the life that really is life. God calls us to something better. And when we put another culture above the culture and kingdom of God, when something else other than Jesus defines our identity, we're prone to think, well, that's just human nature. That's just human nature. We like to get ourselves off the hook. That doesn't cut it. If we read Scripture and pay attention, God doesn't leave it at that. We are called to trust in God's power to transform our sinful human nature, to make us a new creation under the lordship of Jesus, centered in and defined by our faithfulness to God, defined by our love of God and love of neighbor. And that transformation is not in some distant, far-off future, but it's offered to us every single day. God wants to enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that, as Paul writes in chapter 2 of Ephesians, according to the riches of His glory, He may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through His Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Brothers and sisters, that's our hope. That's what God wants us to build our life on. That's what God wants us to be defined by. To know to the very core of our being the hope to which God has called us. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us? That's certainly true in the midst of uh, the times we are in. Who could have known what 2020 would have held for us? We're in the midst of a very difficult year. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty tired. Um, and I have to remind myself again and again, this, this is temporary. You know, in every 100, 120 years, if you look back in history, we have these pandemics, and you know, it's tragic and it's terrible. But there's life on the other side of that. I remind myself of that. It doesn't help as much as I want it to. It's hard having conversations with family members about why you can't get together. It's hard uh, knowing that, were it not for the pandemic, our church might be busting at the seams. It's hard knowing that when all this is open, which is great, wonderful, this has kind of been a, uh, a really bright spot in uh, the year 2020. It's hard knowing that when all this opens up, we're not going to be able to use it at first the way we would like to. It's a difficult year. You know, pile on top of that, all the opinions, opinions and disagreements and political struggles that, get kind of, that are kind of baked into that cake. It's really difficult. And I, I just want to ignore, though I can't, 
That, you know, all the disagreements we've had in our denomination, they haven't gone away. It's difficult. But I have hope. We have hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ. We have hope because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that lifted Jesus to the throne as Lord of all creation, the same power is given to us in the Holy Spirit. That's our hope. It's not found in any of these cultural commitments, any of these uh, things that... that you know, want to claim our identity and claim our time, claim our energy. It's not found there. It's found in Jesus Christ. The Lordship of Jesus and in the culture of God. That's our hope. So cling to that hope, church. Put your whole trust in the grace of God and know the transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ in the culture of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stand and join me um, as we um, respond to the word proclaimed by affirming our faith. Um, this is an affirmation of faith uh, found on the back of uh, your hymnal, which we don't have out there right now. So you have to take my word for it. See there, 888. Um, and this is an affirmation from 1 Corinthians 15 and Colossians 1. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe in Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross, reconciles all things to God. Amen. We continue to be grateful for the generosity um, of the people of God that supports the work of ministry, um, the, the caring for the sick and the hungry that happens out of this church um, and the work that we do together. If you um, would like to give your tithe or your offering, um, you may do so either send a check to the church or you can do so online. The link is here provided for you to be able to do that. Um, I would remind you if you want to um, give to the support of the building project, you can always do that. There is a drop down on the menu you know, online where you can give to the overflowing campaign. That's our building campaign. Or you can um, send a check that is marked in the memo line for overflowing and it will make sure that it goes um, to the continuing work of this project. Let us pray. God of mercy and compassion, what is the offering that pleases you most? Certainly not the token gifts that make us feel that we've done all that is required, but a gift that reminds us that need is all around us and compassion and love are needed desperately and can be given extravagantly. May the gifts that we give through your church help the hungry and the thirsty and the imprisoned. But may our whole being be centered on seeking opportunities to personally make your love real to a hurting world. We follow in Christ's holy, loving way. Bless these gifts and show us the way. Amen. Our closing hymn is a personal favorite, Crown Him with Many Crowns. I invite you to sing with joy and thanksgiving to the Lord.
just a couple of announcements before the benediction. The first is that um, Pastor Richard will be online for Children's Connect at 1130. If you want to hop on Zoom and join him, he'd love to, to have you with him. Um, and then the second is that there are, are a couple things happening this afternoon. The youth are meeting online um, t- this evening. Um, and we have for you a gift. So we have a, written a devotion. Our focus during the season of Advent, which starts next Sunday, is joy. So uh, Wes and I have put together a devotion book on joy um, from the book of Psalms for you. So there's a devotion here for every day um, during the season of Advent. We'll start that next week. But we want you to have it so you can start next week. So if you want to come by the church this afternoon between... Uh, four and five. Wes and I will be out in the parking lot and we'd love to greet you and hand you a devotion book and then a little gift from your church for your at-home worship station. And if you didn't get the first at-home worship station, then you can pick one of those up too because we still have some of those as well. It has a candle and a baptismal shell um, and a little bit of cloth there for you. And this has a, a purple cloth for Advent as well as information about a mission that we're working on together, a reverse Advent calendar where we're going to be collecting gifts all during the season of Advent. Um, to give to urban ministry so there's a different thing each day so instead of taking something you're going to give something so um, like you know hats and gloves and combs and things like that that people who are homeless may need so um, you can pick these up today at four o'clock here at the church um, and we would love the opportunity to do that for you Um, Mike Brown is in the back I'm sure he wants to tell us about the Christmas trees trees well I'm going to do that on here so Christmas trees are here and if you would like to buy them, okay, they are. We start selling Christmas trees today between one and seven. Um, the they will be on sale all this week. Yes or no? All this week. We have a hundred trees. That's it. So um, if you want to get your Christmas tree from us, I suggest you you know get on it. So. Um, and if you'd like to help sign up, you can, there, is a, there was a link in an email that you received this week where you can sign up to help sell Christmas trees. And all that supports, in case you don't know, we're not doing that just for fun. Uh, all that money supports missions that are supported by the United Methodist Men of our church. So I really hope that you all will take advantage of the opportunity to buy your Christmas tree or to help sell one um, here at our church. Okay, that was a lot of announcements, and I'm going to hush so Wes can do his thing. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Whether you are here with us in person or online, we are glad that you worshiped with us. Go now with this benediction. Let us go living in God's culture. Let us be defined by the love of God, the grace and mercy of Jesus, and the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Amen.